Hey Tabletop Life fans, this is Thomas Bird here with Pro Tabletop. Going to talk about my Ultramarines list, Gladius. I'm going to get a lot of questions on how it works. I usually have a little bit unorthodox list. I have some normal units, but then I have some weird off the wall lists. So I want to kind of walk through some of the choices I make, uh, why I do it, how I play it, some of the scenarios we do in the game. Maybe it gives you a little bit of insight, some tips and tricks, if you will. Um, and uh, if, if you play Ultramarines or if you play Gladius, uh, it might give you some new thoughts or tricks to try in your games, and hopefully that'll help you out. So if you enjoy this content, hit that like, subscribe, and share, and uh, let's jump right in. All right, here we are with the list. This is a list I just recently came back from DreamHack Dallas. Um, this is really kind of built around teams, so not necessarily singles, but it's kind of take-all comers, so you definitely can play it in a singles environment. It doesn't really have tons of bad matches uh, for the most part. If you play it well, it has all the tips, all the tools, all the tricks to kind of play into all of those matches and give you at least a fighting chance to pull out a victory. You're not usually winning by a lot with this list unless your opponent is just like really hard countered or if they make a mistake. But uh, you definitely aren't feeling like I uh, have a list problem when I play most armies. So let's go through it real quick and then I'll kind of point to some scenarios and things I like to do in game. So first of all, characters. Marines, I just really want characters to power their units up. With the new missions right around the corner, don't know if I'll tweak these lists. We're waiting to see what the, the points is, but I still think I can do the missions as they look like they are with the current list. So we'll see if it changes at all with the new incoming meta. But for now, uh, a Libby with Phobos armor. So this is kind of a tech choice. Certainly not something you see a lot in competitive play, but this guy's special ability is after you shoot, you can move D6 inches. He's in Phobos armor, so he can only join Phobos guys. I have him join the Incursors typically. We'll kind of run through why that's good. But D6 inch move after you shoot, the implications on the surface don't seem like that big a deal, but I'll walk you through some scenarios where I think it's fantastic. It's hard for me to not take this guy after playing with him a bit. We have the Apothecary Biologus, Gladius, this guy is kind of a staple. He's got the Fire Discipline, so the character himself gives you lethal. The Enhancement gives you sustained. If you're in the Shooting Doctor, Devastate Doctor, now you lethal and sustain on fives. So, can buff a lot of units. I usually put him with Aggressors, but I've been really lately been putting him with Eradicators, which we'll talk about that choice and the differences and, and how it works in the game. A Captain, this guy... I liken him to a little mini Chaos Lord. So he's just, he's got an ability, a finest hour once per game, he can just go full power. He basically gets three extra attacks and his attacks become devastating. So when he's fully powered up, you give him an enhancement, the Honor of Element, which gives him an extra attack and extra strength. And if he's in a Doctrine, plus two attacks and plus two strength. So when he's all powered up, he's gonna have strength 10 attacks. Then he's gonna use devastating wounds we run him with the Assault Intercessor so he has reroll wounds. And then if you use the, the strat, he can get plus one to wound and extra AP. So you make him a little mini beat stick, full hits, full wound rerolls, pretty powerful. This is a little nice little missile package. Can run in and do a lot of damage. And Uriel, good old Uriel. He, uh, his main use is he's attacks to give an infantry unit deep strike, which is a powerful ability on some of these units and really makes them uh, a threat to your opponent but I like Uriel as a captain he has some neat tricks so I'm always struggling to kind of like give him a unit to run around with points are always tight and Uriel's kind of an afterthought but we'll talk about some of the choices I've made and how I go back and forth and what I like to do with Uriel of course you got to have Calgar he's just the beat stick in himself the shenanigans with the Vitress guard we'll talk about how that works and then him giving extra CP CP is such a valuable commodity, especially in Gladius, where you want to do lots of tricks and spend lots of CP. It's hard not to have Calgar in your pocket. Company Heroes. These guys at 95 points are a steal. Four wound guys. A lot of people, especially playing Vanguard, you're used to seeing Uriel run with this. So I see a lot of people get confused. They think Uriel is going with these guys. No. For me, Calgar is joining these guys. We'll talk about the synergies they have there, but... Him in that unit, very powerful. Uh, you, you never want to go back once you kind of run with that and see how that works. 
You got a Land Raider Redeemer doing Land Raider Redeemer things, typically transporting the captain and the incursors. So they're going to run around and do infantry things and threaten to attack you. You can, in a pinch, put the Eradicators or Aggressor unit in there, but they take up the full transport. So you have to kind of figure out who's not riding in the ride if you want to put them inside. And like I said, in this list, we got the Eradicators instead of the Aggressors. It's not a straight swap. Aggressors are slightly more expensive. The profiles are, there are some scenarios where the Aggressors are better. There's some scenarios where the Eradicators are way better. It's very situational. So when we're talking about lists, you just kind of, kind of think about what list you're more likely to face, which one's better. So we can kind of talk about a little bit about that. But in this list, Eradicators. And here's an interesting spicy choice. I have Inceptors. We all know they're good. People who don't play Marines often think they're the most brokenest thing when you're just like deep strike three inches. But people who do play Inceptors realize, one, they're super expensive, and two, sometimes they just come in and whip and then they just die. And it's a lot of points. And uh, while you'd love to take three units of them, you can't. And it just becomes like, you can't complain about them, but you also like wish they would do more things. And then you have the choice between Plasma and Bolter. So I really love the Bolters. And when I can put them in a full six man stack, there's a lot of neat tricks you can do in Gladius. So in this list points, I don't have enough for multiple units of Inceptors. I like the one unit of six over the two units of three. And I definitely like Bolters over the Plasma. And I'll kind of go through the reasoning why. I think there's definitely a place for Plasma. Certain lists benefit from it more. Depends on what the rest of your list has. If one's a better choice than others. But you can't go wrong with either. But in my list, I really like the Bolters. All right, so the rest of the support stuff. We have one Lancer for the anti-tank. I go back and forth with the Lancer. It's a great option. But sometimes you just want a little bit more unit activation or more shots. Sometimes you're playing with units that have great invulnerable saves and you're like, I just shoot my two shots and it doesn't do a lot of damage. But when you do get one through, the rerolls make it nice that you're going to get big damage. And it's AP4. The ability to manipulate the AP, ignore cover. With Gladius, you can make it go high if you're shooting at two up saves, land raiders, for example. Wrapping it up with all the infantry. Lots of infantry in this list. You can kind of see the whole stash of dudes. Um, lots of mission play, lots of activity activations it's nice to have a little bit of trash running around but you have assault intercessors sergeant with a power fist you have the accursed incursors with a mine their special ability is they can shoot at something and give it plus one to hit in the shooting phase so it doesn't work for melee but jump out shoot something everyone else gets plus one to hit that's very useful for the eradicators it's very useful for the inceptors especially if you like plus one to hit with oath or eradicators shooting at monsters of vehicles and you're just fishing for sixes or lethals explode so you want to make sure that even when you do miss you get the best chance to get some more hits so you always want to fish these guys give you the best chance infiltrators very expensive 100 points but like when they work they work it's hard to say no to some infiltrators in a marine list every person who's ever said i can't deep strike within 12 always complains about infiltrators when you take them out you really feel it so Got to have at least one unit infiltrators in my mind. And then three units of scouts. So I was on the fence. I really wanted a few more points to put in a, a turret. I love the fire strike turrets. We'll pull those out kind of in some examples as some alternate play. But I, I didn't quite have enough points in this particular version of the list. So picked up the third unit of scouts. And quite honestly, going from two scouts to three scouts, kind of a big deal. Having one more scout unit to run around, do actions. If I get aggressive in the early turns, sacrifice some scouts to either score missions or move block, I don't feel like all of a sudden I have no scouts in the late game, which they can now become very powerful with their up and down or their screening. So it's nice to have a third unit. Um, I wouldn't consider them a work unit, but sometimes they're just way better than what you need for scoring points. So that's the list. On paper, kind of unassuming. And that's half the trick of this list. So let's talk through some of the scenarios now and see what I do with all this stuff and how I do more than you think with what you see on the table. All right, so let me set this scenario up for you. We're gonna kind of talk through a couple options here because one of the things about this list and the way I play it is when you get to a situation, 
I like to have multiple choices. And sometimes that's a little problematic, but sometimes that's good because not everything will always work out. Maybe they screened you a little bit better than you want or that distance is a little too far. So shooting or fighting may not be the right answer. Sometimes they have fight last or some things that you have to manipulate or navigate and the choice is not always clear. So I like to have a couple of different options. So I'll kind of walk you through a scenario here and we'll kind of go through a couple of the options I like to consider. But this scenario happens quite often. So something I intentionally plan for, played lots of times. So imagine this scenario. We have our land raider here. It's got the captain and the assault squad. It's got the foolish librarian and the incursors. So it's threatening this objective, but based on the way the terrain is, the opponent was able to put this uh, rhino, let's say it's filled with 10 plague marines in here. Behind the plate, obscured, not easily gettable. I could try to drive my rhino over here, or land raider over here to shoot. Maybe I get an angle, maybe I don't. Do I jump the guys out? But I have the problem of I need to crack the rhino first, and then I want to punch the guys inside. They're pretty far away. How do we manage and manipulate all of that, right? So let's talk through some scenarios. And then, you know, in, if this is Death Guard, let's pretend like this is a carnivore in the, waiting in the wings. So we know that whatever we do here, there's going to be some potential uh, consequences on the clapback. So we want to try to minimize that or maybe set up to uh, punish the opponent for coming to get us. So I'm going to come right back. I'm going to move some guys and then we'll talk about why. All right, scenario one. So we're able to drive the land raider up 12 and disembark the guy. Since the land raider has the assault ramps rule, I can still get out and still assault. So looking at this angle here, the land raider can still see the rhino. So we have the option there to shoot it with the land raider and then assault it with the guys, provided I am able to break it. And I'm close enough that if the guys were able to fall out, I'm still close enough that it's not a terribly difficult charge. But when we do this, we know that this knight is available to come out. If this is a unit of Plague Marines with fight first guy charging into the guys, even though they're battle shock, they won't be able to overwatch me. They still could potentially do some damage. And the captain can fight those guys, but he doesn't want to like take casualties unnecessarily. So a potential option you have here is bringing in the eradicators. And so we're talking about eradicators. They should easily pick up a rhino. Ideally, if you have that soft a target for the eradicators, you could potentially try to shoot at another unit. Maybe they have a predator. You can drop and try to split fire. But if you're just absolutely going for the kill here, go for it with the eradicators. We have a couple different options. We can put the eradicators back here where they're kind of safe and out of line of sight. Potentially, though, you have to worry about does he have maybe a predator back here where he can peek and see so you can kind of uh, manage this angle down here so he can't see down this line. Or maybe he has reserves where he can peek and you're thinking about screening so that he can't get a line of sight. Or if you want to be more aggressive, you can go here, put the eradicators, now threaten if the knight comes out of the plate, you can overwatch him. Now you are in danger, but you can potentially make him think twice about putting that knight there. Similarly, if you put this thing down here, you know by process of elimination, if you do break that rhino, he's not going to put the guys up here because he doesn't want them to get flamed. So you know he's going to force him to put the guys back here or potentially back here because he wants to stay away from the captain, but he also needs to stay out of line of sight. So you can kind of force his hand your opponent in terms of where he places his guys. So if you really wanted to, you can now put inceptors here to shoot the guys when they come out. Because you know they're going to put down, you're going to have two damaged bullets. Let's do some stuff. So let's think about the sequence and then how we do it. I'm going to go ahead and go put all in just so you can see all the options. And then we'll talk about the ramifications on the follow-up turn. All right, so we've got the eradicators out. We've got the bolter and scepters out. So let's talk about our options now. So we have a lot more options now to do a ton of damage. And really it's about focused, concentrated firepower to kind of guarantee as much as we can with dice the result and minimize casualties on our end. With Marines, you want to be hyper efficient. You want to be getting the best value as you can. You don't want to trade units unnecessarily. But sometimes you need to do damage and you want to make sure when you do send the units out, 
that you're getting full power out of them. So in this particular circumstance, we're going to pop Devastator Doctrine because we know we want to get value out of these guys, giving them sustain in the Devastator Doctrine with their enhancement. And if we do decide to pop cover, because he may put some guys in cover here, we want to make sure that we can use it on these Inceptors to get extra value. These guys may need to go in the terrain. Unlikely he can shoot. So, you know, you put these guys here so that you can make sure there's no place he can put the guys and not get seen. If he wants to put them out here out of line of sight, you almost want to tempt them into that so that your land raider can just lane them. So usually it's not a difficult decision. You can, if you really want to guarantee it, put these guys way out here. But you kind of want to think about what's going to be able to get at them and you kind of want to protect these guys as much as you can. So you're kind of setting up angles, trying to use your models and damage potential to limit where they go. So we're just going to put these guys here. We're assuming that he can't escape us. We're going to be able to see no matter where he puts the guys. All right. Now, you got to be outside of three inches. So, option number one, we shoot the Eradicators full power. They're going to hit all wound road rolls. He could potentially pop smoke for cover. We have ignore cover if we want, but with that many melt the gunshots with cover, the best he's going to get is uh, a six up save. So not necessarily the greatest chance. You're so close. You have so many shots. You only need really two, three to go through, maybe even two to kill that. So Mass says it's not worth it for him because you're going to reroll everything for fives anyways, and uh, you should kill that. So that's the, kind of the most easy, obvious answer. Don't split fire. Shoot the whole Eradicators. Your other option, if you really want to, is shoot within cursors. Give you plus one to hit. Now these guys shoot a little bit better. When they do plus one to hit, now they can move D6 inches. Well, what does that mean? You can now move them onto the point. If you need to get more guys on the objective, they still can charge after that movement. So you can now set it up. If you want to position where you want to force him to fall out in a certain direction, you can move and now move block him so he can't fall out in that area. Force him back here, which is kind of what you want. Or you can be aggressive and you can be like, hmm, I move this way and maybe I assault the knight. You're like, well, in curses, charging a carnivore. That's not my first guess, but realistically, Carnival only has five attacks. Mass says, if you charge him, you got five Marines and a character, he can't literally can't kill them all. So if you just want to hold them up, that's the best way to stop a knight. Just run in and charge him. You got mortals. You got the grenade. You actually have slapping with lethals. You might do a few wounds on the way. And so you're just acting as a delay sequence there. Or if you really want to, you could shoot, give the plus one to hit. D6 inch move, back in the land raider. Then your incursors are safe for another turn to do work. Alternatively, as a backup plan, you could be like, well, I shoot. Let me see how it goes. Oh, I didn't quite kill it. I have some guys position here, guys position here. If I need to, throw a grenade, maybe to finish it off. Or if I need to, this guy got out within three inches. He can throw the haywire mine, finish it off. So you have options there for mortal wounds uh, on the vehicle if you need to kind of get it done if the dice go catastrophically wrong. So it shouldn't happen, but it, it does. So sometimes you got to plan for that contingency just to make sure. If you're putting all your points down right here, you can't afford for this rhino to live, and then now you're forced to charge it, and it gets all screwed up. All right. Last contingency is multiple charges into the rhino. So worst case scenario, all your plans go to crap. You don't kill the rhino, but you leave it on a few wounds. You want to charge it with the incursors. Again, they they shoot, they move. Now they still could charge. They charge it, and now that lets your captain charge as well. And potentially, you finish off the last couple of wounds with the incursors, and then you go in and punch it with the captain. He can now pile into the guys that fall out and do it. You also have the bolters if, for whatever reason, the rhino is still alive. They obviously can't shoot the guys inside. They can finish it off. So you should, you have more than enough to kill a rhino with all of this. Bolter guys at strength five, they can easily, with twin link, pepper that rhino down if you want. In the Devastator Doctrine, you can pop it on them. So you can give them plus one to hit. With the incursors, if you oath that thing, they're re-rolling all the wounds, hitting on twos and wounding on fives. You can do ignore cover for extra AP. In the Devastator Doctrine, now you're AP two. So you're shooting on 
Hitting on two, six is double explode. You're just re-rolling everything that's not a six. And then you're looking for five, so when you can easily do enough damage with the incursors just to pick up that rhino. So lots of options. You could, if you're really aggressive, position the incursors in such a way or the infiltrators or the inceptors in such a way that you force him to fall out on this side. So now he's got to fall out here so that your land raider can now flame the guy. So there's lots of different options in sort of manipulating where the guys go. Um, 10 guys, if there's 10 guys in here, you can do the, like the placement of the guys. There's only so many places he can go and you want to like position so you can force him into certain areas. That's helpful for you. Make the charge a little bit closer make the shooting a little bit easier you don't have to like let him just fall out where he's completely safe but it does take some resources here all right so now we talked about shooting we talked about fighting but we've also haven't talked about what's going to happen next turn so we talked about these guys potentially moving up going over there they have the mine they have the option to just do some damage on that knight and hold them up Let's just say, for argument's sake, that we needed them over here to kind of help do things, either throw a grenade or fight. Another thing, if they have 10 guys and we're not able to shoot them for whatever reason, and they have fight, fight last, what you can use these guys for is, now you can run them in, charge alongside the captain, and now position these guys on the guys that have the, the better fighting equipment, tag them, Throw the mine if you need to in the assault doctor, assault phase. Because again, the mine happens at the start of any phase. So it can happen in the charge phase, the shooting phase of either turn. Your turn or their turn. Do it. Maybe pick off a couple guys. But if you position and touch guys that want to fight, now you maybe force all the hard weapons to fight here. So when they fight first, they can only fight these guys. And now your punching guys are alive to fight at full power and clean up the rest of the unit. So, But let's just say they're over here. They're not attacking this knight. What we've done, we've positioned these guys specifically within four inches of the land raider. Why that number is important is there's an option here. If this knight comes up, we don't overwatch and kill him. We have the option of spending a reactive move. And reactive move in the Devastator Doctrine is just D6 inches. But we have to end our move wholly within, or just within three of a vehicle to get in. So since it's a different phase, we can get in. When we get out, D6 inches, I just need to be uh, within three inches. So if I roll a one, the worst case scenario, uh, I'm within three inches. I just need to be within four. So there's no way I can not get in. So if I really, really want to drop and then be protected next turn, I can stage my guys and the land raider. And you see how I made sure to empty the land raider out because those guys take up all 14 slots. Clear out the land raider. Drop them near the land raider because I'm deep striking them. Put them wherever I want within reason. Now, if something scary runs up to them, and they're not ready to get killed just yet. You could spend one CP to jump in. I've, I've done it. I've seen it where I had multiple nights. Night one comes up, gets overwatched. Lucky, maybe not. Blows up the carnivore. Night number two comes up. And I'm like, well, I'm, uh, I've already overwatched. Can't overwatch again, but I do have one more CP. Thanks, Calgar. I react to move. D6 inches. Oh, I rolled a one. Doesn't matter. I'm within four of the land raider. They get in the land raider. Now the knight's like, oh no. I have to charge the land raider. And unlikely to kill the land raider straight up. But even if it does, it's still good for you because now you guys can fall out. Maybe they fall out on the point or they fall out in safety so that they can kill that carnivore next turn. So always plans within plans with the ultramarines. With the list, you're thinking about not only placement for this turn, but placement for next turn and what the opponent's going to bring to you. You want to have contingencies and offers in that background. So if something goes bad or the dice don't go your way, you have some backup plans to throw in there. This character here makes this unit's utility so great. So one of the things we need to talk about is in curses in general, just the application. So let me set up another scenario and we'll talk through how I love the incursors and what that lieutenant brings to the game. All right, let's look at scenario number two. We have a land raider, same, same configuration, incursors and captain inside. Here's the setup here. We want to get on this objective. We don't really have angles to shoot this knight. And we know in the waiting in the wings, 
are these two vindicators and we don't want to drop our land raider up on the objective and now get shot by potentially two vindicators on the following turn or if we get any guys out in this area get vindicator to death how can we do it what are our options and let's be uh, a little aggressive in our placement and we'd be like make it difficult to say have uh, our eradicators come in and get a line here so if we, we've got this rhino here let's position it so nine inches away i'm going to be so far back i can't get an angle to shoot up into there so if he screened us out with the vindicator shooting or you know and we don't have any place to put our eradicator so we don't get to do our tricks with the eradicators and maybe we have something here so there's no space to drop so how do we do it and we just want to use the incursors and the captain we want to save the eradicators for another threat if he's like now constantly having to worry about eradicators deep striking in he's got to spend resources to screen he's got to give units to us that's exactly what we want we're going to take those units from him so that way when it's go time with the eradicators he doesn't have anything left to stop him. so how do we do that so with this scenario uh, i see this a lot this is something i think about is i'm going to use this incursor squad to try to get extra value by move blocking and tagging this guy if i can get both fantastic but my intention is to now touch this guy either make this guy shoot the incursors or if he wants to fall back he's now in the way this thing cannot now shoot at my land raider and the best he can do is get my incursors we have these guys that can come out and do things to my incursors but like again we're making that sacrificial trade so that land raider is there and safe and if these guys decide they want to get out and mess with them and my land raider doesn't die now the land raider is free to roam around the country potentially boltering or flaming them or my bolters come in next turn now shoot them since they're disembarked and they've done the hard work for me and they've got out of the ride uh, voluntarily so that's what you're trying to entice let's see if we can give them some bait right so and then we have this knight here kind of just coming up the works saying hey if you don't do something about me i'm going to walk in here and attack maybe he's doing deploy teleport homers or something you know that's going to go away but he's there how do we deal with it so let me set the scenario come back and show you what my thought process is here all right so i've rolled the dice i rolled a six for my i went go ahead and win an assault doctrine so i can advance in charge i rolled a six for the incursors so pretty spicy um i've rolled a four for the captain so bad but not not, not i mean not too bad right so we're, we moved up we got here we have some options so here's the options i'm thinking about so looking at the board here the land raiders moved up it cannot see anybody so there's no shooting coming out of it the incursors can shoot and give plus one to hit but we didn't bring down any reserves uh, we always have the option of inceptors but i don't think we want to use them if there's death guard marines hanging out in the rhino we're going to save them so and we don't really need help here so the question now becomes do we think the captain can kill the knight by himself or do we need a little extra help our options are both of these units can throw grenades this unit can shoot um, with lethal hit bolters and you can just fish for sixes re-rolling on the oath target do all the things do a couple shots maybe you chip off a few wounds and that's enough for the captain and then you do have the haywire mine you're always kind of leading with the haywire mine it was within three inches so at the start of the shooting phase he could throw it i'm going to shoot and then move i move d6 inches i roll the five very lucky again so now we're moving five inches now we have the option after we've shot here so when we do that now we have the option to throw a grenade here uh, i'm not a grenade but the haywire mine and then we can also just charge in and then do the mine in the charge phase so the the mine is like we can kind of do it at any point it's only a one shot per game thing so you're kind of always kind of trying to choose your moment you're trying to find a vehicle on a two plus against normal units it does d3 uh mortal wounds but if it's a vehicle it does 2d3 mortal wounds so there's a potential for six mortal wounds if you pop off onto a vehicle not nothing if it's wounded might be enough to kill it you are punching with sustain and lethal hits so there's always the potential you might chip a few wounds a vindicator probably with a two-up save you're not doing that but a knight you certainly could make them take some three-up saves you could fill a couple it might be enough to push them over the edge but in this scenario the captain is more than capable of killing this knight all on his own 
He's in the Assault Doctrine. He's going to be AP3. The Knight's going to only have six up saves. He's going to be re-rolling at least ones to wound because he's not on the objective. But he will be plus one to wound. So all the Chain Swords will be AP2, wounding on fives. Power Fist, wounding on threes. And the Captain, if he pops his full power, which you would in this scenario, he'd be wounding on twos, re-rolling ones with death wounds. So you would have more than enough of the tank to kill this guy. But you do have the option, since you rolled really well here uh, on both squads, is you could elect to charge here into the knight and into the vindicator. Rarely do you want to do a multi-charge, but you could do it and position in such a way where you move block the captain. If he rolls high enough, he can potentially move and now fight the vindicator. So you can try to go for the kill on the vindicator if you think it's warranted. Or you could just play it safe, kill the knight. We're just going to play it safe, kill the knight. We do have some good movement here, but we don't really need to. So let's roll some dice, see what happens. All right, we've rolled a nine for the captain. Squad with the intercessors. You see how I've positioned the guys. I want to try to minimize the extension over this way so that if I do end up killing this guy, I will now be close enough to the objective that I can fall back onto the objective, but I don't want to be close enough where I can tag that vehicle, right? So I want that consolidation back. That's important because now if I can move three inches back towards the land raider, again, we're kind of looking for that four inch number. We might not quite get to four inches, but we put ourselves in that possibility that if these guys get out within nine and I'm no longer in combat because I've killed this knight, I could potentially reactive move back in the land raider. So you always kind of want to set up the land raider as a potential hiding hole to fall back into. So imagine the captain gets run out, punch something, and they come out to get those guys and you say, ha ha, back in the land raider, right? So you don't have to be forced to be like, I need to roll really high to get on the full side of the wall so you can't see me. I just need to get within three inches of the land raider. So you see the land raider kind of, kind of wants to tuck in as tight as I can because I just have to get everyone within three of the land raider and we make it, right? So that's the kind of thought process I'm positioning you guys so to try to like set up a possible escape path over here we rolled an eight so that's pretty good so really kind of above expectations rolled a six for the advance a five for the d6 inch move so we've gotten a lot farther than we anticipated and then we rolled an eight for the charge so we've got positioning so we can now move up big base lieutenant serves an extra portion he does not he takes a, a bigger base so he's now able to like one give you an extra body to kind of body block yourself from basing and he's wider base so now you have a bigger footprint so now in this scenario i have one guy that's not based and he cannot base that way so he gets to float around and potentially now get with engagement range of the other vindicator lucky we don't really need to do that but certainly now that limits his options in terms of wanting to shoot at him so it's kind of good for us so now let's do the combats i'll roll some dice off camera and then we'll come back and see what happens. All right. So as predicted, the captain did his job. The knight made some six ups on its saves, but it still wasn't enough. I had some dev the devastating wounds, was able to finish off uh, the knight. Um, that let me pile back three inches. And if you measure carefully, we're definitely all within four inches. So if anyone moves their move within nine inches, those guys can just get in the land range. So that's super scary over here. We did our attacks. You can see that Vindicator is on five wounds. So um, 11 wound Vindicator. I threw the mine. It went off. 2d3. I rolled five. Pretty good. We're rolling good. Did five wounds to it. And then I punched it. I did only four wounds with lethal hits. But um, he took two up saves. Failed one of them. Six wounds failed. So like there you go. Free kind of wounds on the Vindicator. Really I don't care about wounding it. I'm just there to tie it up. Tagging the second Vindicator. Bonus time. So you're already kind of set up now. Uh, you've set up a hard problem for the Death Guard player. Are they getting out? Potentially, now they have to stay outside of nine inches because they don't want to activate those guys. Are they bringing guys over here? This guy's trapped. He can't really move because he's too close to that wall. This guy has to fall back and he won't be able to shoot. Vindicators have a rule they can shoot their blast guns in the combat, but they really can't because I'm touching multiple units. So it puts you in a pickle, even if they could. You know, you have the option here. And if you did only touch this one, and for some reason they were able to fall back or they say, I want to take a desperate breakout, you move within nine, these guys can get away. So they do have the option of one unit shooting here and just staying in combat with his blast. 
but certainly not the full power. So these guys aren't completely safe. Your opponent can get at them, but it gives them some hard choices. Again, you're really trying to force uh, the opponent to like shoot at the things that you don't want them to. In this scenario, the goal has always been just keep the Land Raider alive. In this scenario, the Land Raider is very important to deal with Plague Marines. It's hard for his vehicles. We don't want those these guys to come out and kill me. And now we've done that. So move blocking, do some free wounds, put the potential captain in a spot he can be saved. And then now we force his hand. So that's an option with the incursors. I love it in combination with the captain. Because they have assault weapons, you can go into the assault doctrine, move up and still shoot. Normally most of the marine units that I'm using, you put in the assault doctrine, they don't have assault weapons, so they can't shoot. Having assault weapons with that Phobos Lieutenant, super important to let them get that extra movement. And again, we're trying to activate that mine. We're trying to get in the way. We're trying to do extra shooting. Now, in those turns where you don't want to just go balls out, you don't want to go flying in, you want to be conservative, you can always do the get out, shoot the unit, give them plus one to hit, D6 inch move back in the Land Raider. So you can always kind of do the shoot and scoot right back in the ride. I've done it where I've set up, hey, maybe I don't want to be on the objective with my Land Raider because Chaos Space Marines gets reroll wounds or Breachers gets reroll wounds. So I'll jump out the incursors, say, hey, you get there. But if they move within nine, reactive move, I can jump back in. Yeah, maybe I sacrifice scoring the objective that turn, but now you've exposed a bunch of units that I could potentially overwatch or kill on the following turn because my Land Raider is not going to die to it, whereas my infantry might get killed. So you kind of always have to look at it from a, what is the opponent going to try to pull out? You're using that land raider as bait sometimes to force them to put units out that your reserves can now pick up. Uh, you're going to put a tank out so my eradicators can now attack outside of your screen. Going to put a bunch of infantry out. My in inceptors can now come out. Can you use the bolters on the inceptors to hit on twos because you threw the incursors out there to give them plus one to hit. Now with oath, they're fishing. If you put them in a devastator doctrine, giving them the ignore cover AP2. Those bolters now become serious threats to just about anything on the table. Even wounding on sixes with twin link, you can do enough damage to just pick up all sorts of stuff. I've had them do eight, 10 wounds, riptides, just fishing for sixes or wounding on fives because riptides are not that tough. So there's lots of things you can do. It's surprising when you have that volume of shots, how much damage it does and when you ramp it up to AP2. So just some thoughts there for the incursors. Let's kind of look at Calgar next and why I put him with the heroes and why I think it's great. All right, Calgar with the Company of Heroes. If you haven't played with this unit and you're using Calgar and you're using heroes, boy, you're missing out. Uh, one of Calgar's main priority abilities is if he's joined to a unit, he gets to advance, shoot, fall back, and still charge. So he gets basically all the abilities of the different doctrines all rolled up in one. Advance and shoot, advance and charge, advance and fall, or fall back, and still charge and shoot. So like... Having him attached to a unit, always good. A lot of people like to attach him to eradicators or to aggressors because, hey, I'm going to move up. I want to shoot those guys. They have relatively short range. Aggressors have punching. Eradicators want to get in melter range. Makes a lot of sense. Um, when you add the biologist to him, now you're really putting a lot of points in one big unit. It's got a large footprint, and it now gets you up to 10 models with his little bodyguards, the Vitrix Guard. So it makes him double blastable, which against certain targets... You just don't want to risk getting double blast. In my mind, I'd rather have the Eradicators or the Aggressor Package as a separate unit instead of having one five or 600 point unit. I have a you know a 200, you know, 80 point unit and another 280 point, 300 point unit. So I have two units instead of one. More activations, more threat, project, draw them out. You do the things. And when you put Calgar with the heroes, you do something that most people don't understand, uh, how much damage this little unit can take. Because like on math of it, it doesn't seem like they're a big deal. And when you actually play the game, this unit can tank so many things, especially if you, you buy into armor or contempt. So let's talk about the math of it, right? So each Marine in the Company Heroes, four wounds. So that's, a, that's a, it's an odd break point for all those three damage weapons out there. Um, if you're doing two damage weapons, now it takes two to go through. They don't have any feeling of pain on the individual guys, but it's just twice as many wounds as a typical Marine squad's going to have. So four guys, 16 moons, it's going to take a little bit of beef to chew through it. If you're doing three damage, 
It's going to take two, three damage hits to go through. And with their native ability of minus one to wound, theoretically, they're doing a lot less wounds to you, right? So if they don't do quite as many wounds to you, and you have this weird breakpoint, they just don't die as quickly as you think. They have weird weapons. They have a three damage heavy bolter. They have a two damage stern guard bolter that does dev wounds. They have a banner for extra OC. They have a precision hit on swords. So it starts becoming this interesting package where if you just run up on an objective with the banner guy, seven dudes fully intact, that's 14 OC. Like you can overpower people just on OC. And no one really wants to kind of run in and punch Calgar unless they got some beef to it. And if they're going to shoot at him, if you have armor contempt, now you've got Vitreous Guard with four invulnerable saves and two up saves that also have wounds that you can take. Three saves, three wounds each. So if you have cover, if you have armor contempt on a two up save, they're only hitting you with AP2 weapons. Now you can potentially take a bunch of two up hits on Vitreous Guard and keep the units alive, right? So like you, you have this potential to take wounds wherever you want. Now, one of the critical things here is offensively, the shooting is kind of marginally crazy, but when you start advancing and shooting these guns, potentially like three damage bolter pops off, it's double sustained. It could just randomly do work. You need a couple dev wounds here or there, the bolter pops off. Calgar gets to run and shoot. He's got twin link weapons. Not too bad for a little trash shooting that potentially does big damage. But in melee, when you talk about a fully powered uh, company heroes unit, it starts to add up. It's like really a lot of attacks because each of the little guys, you have three of them, have five attacks, strength four, AP nothing. So you have 15 basic Joe attacks. Then you have the sword attacks. The Vitress Guard and the and the Champion have basically the same profile, five, two, two. The Vitress have five each. The Champion has six each. So now you're talking about 16 strength five, AP two, two damage sword attacks. Pretty good, but they hit on twos. You're like, mm, pretty good, pretty good. And then Calgar has six attacks, strength eight, AP three, three damage that's twin link. So Calgar is always hitting on twos, twin link, strength eight fists, three damage, he's doing work. So you're always kind of looking for a place for Calgar to go in there and punch. So he's very powerful just by himself. This is a good delivery vehicle. It could tank a lot of hits. You're just trying to get Calgar stuck in and get him punching as quickly as you can. If you get him in full power, now you have a lot more attacks to go with them. If you have CP, if you're in the doctrine for assault doctrine, potentially you're running and the captain's charging at the same time. Now you can spend the strat on him. The captain can spend his captain ability to put his strat for free. Now you both can pop the strat plus one to wound extra AP. So now all those strength five attacks can now be plus one to wound. Now you're punching tanks, wounding on fives. Um, you can be punching strength nines, wounding on fours. And then Calgary just go to work, right? So this unit now becomes pretty spicy just in terms of sheer volume and attacks. It's not just become uh, a random guy to keep Calgar alive or Uriel alive. It becomes a serious offensive threat. And then defensively, the profiles on it, very dangerous. And one of the things that really catches people off guard, if you're shooting full power and you're like, I'm dedicating the full power, maybe Calgar's had to commit and he's just going to, he's going to take it and there's nothing you can do about it. Armor contempt or not, you're just taking it in the face. One of the things that people don't understand, sometimes get caught off guard when I play this game, is you're free to allocate wounds to the Vitrix guard anytime you get shot. But in reality, you only ever want to kill one Vitrix guard. You never want to take hits on both Vitrix guard. You want to leave the last Vitrix guard alive for as long as you can. The reason why is... Calgar's unit by himself, he says he has ability, as long as one Vitreous Guard alive, if Calgar takes wounds, he's got a four up from the pain. So the, the process is, as soon as these guys die, you take as many hits on this Vitreous Guard as you can, and as soon as all of these guys, the second that last guy dies, if there's any wounds left, or if it's another activation, doesn't matter, if you look in the leader rules, you can now allocate wounds to a character. If they're still alive, you cannot allocate wounds wounds to characters but these guys are not characters so you can allocate it to them just like normal but as soon as this last guy dies you're free to allocate it to Calgar and then what that means is now Calgar's taking saves not him and he's taking saves with four feel no pain and as soon as he dies this unit now becomes toughness six because you take the toughest uh you take the strongest profile of the toughness if you if you join to a bodyguard unit you take the the, the lowest but if you're an individual character you take the highest so he's now toughness six. If they, any extra shots come in after that first volley that killed his friends, now he, you resolve at toughness six. 
So it's almost like he still kind of has minus one to lose against most weapons. He's extra tough. He's taken two up saves with a four up invulnerable, potentially armor of contempt. And then on top of that, he's got four up fill of pain. So he ends up being able to tank a, a tremendous amount of damage if you can roll four ups. And uh, it now lets this unit be alive. That's good for you because you get extra CP if he's alive. And obviously, Calgar being alive is he punches things pretty good. So if they send in full commit to punch him and if they don't kill him, now he's able to punch back and the Vitor Scar is still alive. You get an extra punching back as well. So very strong unit. It's important to understand the implications. Do some math on minus one to wound with four wounds. What that really can tank, you'd be quite surprised how much damage they take. If you have the, the luxury of armor contempt, even better. Two up save, ignore cover. If they don't have ignore cover, that two up save becomes pretty monstrous. You could potentially just like, hey, Blood Angels with a million power fist attacks, AP2. Did you spend for the AP3? Yes, no, maybe. Armor Contempt, I got three up saves. Maybe I got two up saves. Um, I guess that's melee, so you wouldn't have cover. But um, you have a potential to just take a bunch of hits on this guy. Um, he's only three wounds, but he if he's taking two damage, you take him two at a time. So you're just kind of like trying to minimize the number of attacks that kind of go through all these other guys. So it's interesting how many attacks you can actually tank even from units where you assume it would just auto die. All right, last but not least, talk about the blade guard. Good old blade guard. There is a place for six blade guard uh, with Uriel. That's quite a powerful unit. If you're going full hog with the six man, you really almost want the lieutenant to kind of complete the package. Giving him fall back, even though you're in Gladius, able to do that without having to be in the doctrine is very powerful. It gives you extra attacks because the lieutenant, you can give him a fist or a sword, extra attacks. And then you're fishing for lethals. Pretty big deal, especially if you pop plus one to wound. Now that unit can do a lot of things. If you're in the doctrine, extra AP, that's a lot of sword attacks that come out of there. But I don't have the points for that. That's a different list. It depends on what you're playing against, whether you really want to lean more into the melee. Uh, terrain can impact that quite a bit. Uh, or the shooting. I like to have a mix of both. But what I what I used to run was just Yuria by himself. Like, you can give him Assault Intercessors. You can just run him around by himself. Sometimes you're like, I just need to get Tempting Target, but I don't have anybody. Yuria, just advance onto the thing. Or I need to investigate signals, right? So now in the new world of actions, sometimes it's nice to just have a lone character that you're not really invested in a lot of points that he can just go do something in the background. And he's not a super threat. No one's going to chase him down. He is a captain. He's got three up save, four up and vulnerable save, five wounds. So a unit of random chumps is not going to casually come pick him up, right? So um, there's the potential. But I do like my units to do stuff. And what I found is Uriel with the unit of Blade Guard does some interesting things. Is, is it groundbreaking? Is it world beating? No. But what it does do is offers me, again, that thing I'm always looking for is a little bit of flexibility. So let's talk about a couple of use cases I have with this guy. So typically, I have the incursors inside the land raider because that gives them a jumping off point to do their advance and charge. It gives them a safe place if they want to duck and weave and pop out plus one to hit and jump back in. But sometimes, you know, Uriel can just be like, hey, I want to ride in the land raider because in this particular matchup, my melee is going to be more important. Or maybe it's in a turn where, hey, incursors, I need you to go move block, maybe throw that mine on somebody. But I don't really want to commit the captain. Or maybe the captain has escaped and jumped back in. Yurio can also run and now jump in the land raider, and now he's staged for the land raider. Either way, you also have the option of advance and charge. So like he could just be lurking near the land raider, and when it's go time for the fight turn, he just advances and charges with the rest of the folks. So the interesting thing with Uriel, he's got two special rules if he's joined. So if he's not joined, you don't get to use this. this is another reason why having him joined as something uh, is kind of useful. Uh, rule number one is if he's battle shocked, he can still do strats. So interesting, you know, super impactful, not necessarily, but like if you want to armor contempt or if you uh, want to uh, fight better, plus one to wound melee, you still can do it even if you're battle shocked. So that comes up occasionally and it's like, Nice rule to have. Um, and also, um, he can do a strat that's already been used. So that's important because he wants a melee. Calgar wants a melee. The captain wants a melee. You only have one fight first strat, or fight with plus one to wound strat. But if you pop the strats in the right sequence, Calgar pops the strat. Uriel pops the strat. He still has to pay for it, but he can now pop a strat that's already been used. And then the captain pops a strat. Now all three of the units can have plus one to wound and extra AP. 
So now if you really have a go turn for fighting, you can turn on all three units, have them pop off with AP3 plus one to wound. Not too shabby. Another thing with, with Uriel is Blade Guard special rule. They have the ability to say, hey, at the beginning of the fight phase, I have to choose. Do I want to reroll once for my invulnerable save or do I want to reroll once to hit? So you're like, okay, whatever. Not too, not too crazy. There's just three guys there. Who cares? Well, what ends up happening is if he's running in with the captain, you can potentially use these blade guard to, again, maybe touch and tag the heavy hitters. So now the invulnerable saves are getting put onto these guys and not on the squishy assault intercessors or maybe the captain himself. Now they're taking four ups, re-rolling ones. They have three wounds. So if they're hitting you with two damage, it takes a little bit more wounds to kind of punch through the blade guard. You don't really care if they die. They're just there to take wounds. If it's not a unit that you're super scared of, but you have your oath committed elsewhere, you just want a little bit more reliability in their fighting. You pop reroll ones to hit. They have four attacks each. They're hitting on threes, no big deal. A couple more hits. But Uriel, he hits on twos with six attacks that are sustained. So if you pop reroll ones to hit, now he's hitting better, potentially getting a couple of sustains. And him plus them, now this little package becomes quite a bit of two damage attacks that can do some work on something. So you soften it up with a mine or maybe you throw a grenade and then he runs in. He can punch down knights. He can punch down rhinos. Like all sorts of crazy little things happen from this unit. And you don't even care if you like tag those guys uh, because these blade guard can potentially take some of those hits. So not a bad unit for what you get out of it. This is 90 points. You're, you're buying him. He's 75 points. You're always buying him for the deep strike. So you kind of just sunk cost in this particular list. And now I like to get added value out of him. He, now he becomes a little mini threat. He could just be sitting over there near an objective, threatening some trash that wants to come over there. And uh, like five incubi that might just pick up the, the little captain squad they might not kill these guys. You know, you just roll some fours, you reroll ones, they're only two damage, they might get the swing. Um, if they blunt enough attacks, Euro gets a punch, he might kill the, the five incubi. Like, just an example, right? So, like, lots of little options where this unit is a little bit more durable than the Assault Intercessors. I have run them with Assault Intercessors. I do like them with the plus one to wound, extra AP, rerolling all the wounds. They can seriously punch, just like with the Captain. But sometimes you don't need that extra damage. You want the extra durability. And so it's kind of a choice... I like this just for a different option. It gives my opponent a different look, makes them take some different decisions if they have to swing on both units, how they want to allocate their attacks. Sometimes they just don't want to put hits on four and vulnerable saves, and it means quite a bit. So there's an option there, and that's what I like. So Blade Guard with the Uriel running around doing Blade Guard things. All right, we talked about the Blade Guard or the, the Bolter and Scepters. And the Incursor combo, but let's, let's we kind of glanced on it, but let's let's talk about it a little bit more in depth, just so you guys have a full appreciation for the potential power. So again, the Incursor special rule is as long as they get a hit, they pick one unit that they shot at and hit, and that unit now gets plus one to hit. So in this scenario, I could potentially shoot all the guns there. Maybe I shoot just one gun at my target. It has oath. As long as I roll one hit out of my couple of shots, I get plus one to hit. So then I can do my D6 move. Maybe I'm moving away. I'm still charging this Vindicator, but I've like thrown the plus one to hit. And now my Bolter guys are shooting. Maybe it's this Rhino. And I'm like, hey, we want to shoot this Rhino dead. Let's do it. Like strength five Bolters, toughness nine Rhino. Not the most ideal target, but if we're in the Devastator Doctrine, say we hid the Eradicators. We don't want to put them in yet. Bolters come down. Pop the strat. We're in Devastator Doctrine, so now we get an extra AP. Now it's AP2, ignore cover. The damage is high, right? So if we roll some dice, if you're just thinking about it, three shots each, that's going to be six guys. That's 18 shots. Hitting on twos is, say, this, this Rhino is Oath. Sixes are double exploding. We'll just roll some dice real quick. We're just fishing for sixes. Like, we're hitting on twos. And you know, I always like to do it because math is weird. You're like, okay, look, I missed with four. So as long as I fish and roll all of these and roll less than four misses, then I'm still gravy, right? So I roll. Look at that. I hit three more sixes. I only miss one. So now double explode on sixes means I have five sixes here. That turns into ten more additional hits on top of these. So now I'm rolling for fives twin linked. So all full rerolls. You're just fishing, fishing, fishing. 
looking for fives, looking for fives, twin linked. Lots of wounds, lots of wounds, lots of wounds. And then you say, oh, I still have 10 more dice to roll. 10 more dice to roll. So you just like more fives, all the fives, right? Twin linked. And you're like, how many freaking saves did I just make him take? Like all the saves, right? If this is not uncommon, I just did a little better than average, but still. Out of my 18 shots, I made him take 15 saves on wounding on fives. So that's a lot of shots. It's a lot of wounds. He's AP2. You're talking about I need five ups to save with my rhino, and it ignores cover. And so you're like, you know, even if I roll good, which I rolled six saves pretty good, still going to die and then some. Right? So the potential there is high. Any kind of infantry unit, it just shreds AP2, two damage. Shooting at orc boys, you're shooting at warriors, you're shooting at even three damage guys. You're shooting at, this could be a unit at eight bound taking saves that are all two damage, right? They're toughness six, you need to wound on fives, same profile. They're taking that many failed saves. Like you could just pick up units of eight bound if you're playing world leaders. So lots of interesting units. And then now you have the option. Maybe it's not oath, maybe it is. You're like, don't move next to them because they can overwatch. If they roll any sixes, you're like, oh no, math says I should roll three sixes. Guess what? Oh, I got four. That means I get an extra eight hits i just scored that many hits on overwatch that are twin linked that's so many right like you can just set up overwatch channels for these guys and it's brutal so the bolter inceptors in my eyes money in the bank full rerolls if you can spend oath if you have the luxury of spending the strat even if you don't have the devastator doctrine you're just ignoring cover ap1 ignore cover not so bad you can put a lot of damage on guys and here's the real kicker so we talk about setting up for the fallback into the rhino we're talking about how do i keep guys safe for the clap back you know what most people don't understand is gravis guys and fly guys can fit in the land raider and it takes exactly seven guys these guys take up the same spot as a gravis eradicator or aggressor two spots so you can easily put the six man bolter guys in the ride so you can do the reactive move if you set them up close and scepters since you deep strike three you have a lot of control over the placement you set them up within four inches of the land raider make sure the land raider is empty so they have a space to go somebody ends their move with a nine d6 inch move you're like boop back into the land raider safe and sound ready to do that stuff again the next turn super crazy super uh, nasty gives you lots of flexibility even when you tell your opponent that you can do it you, you want to put that fear of if they move near you, it potentially puts them in a difficult position. So that's the, that's the play with the Inceptors. I love them. They do lots of work. The Strength 5 Bolter um, is not the greatest into toughness 10 or higher, but still, even fishing on 6s, you can get some, some wounds if it's worst case scenario, chip them down, and you will have options for more wounds to kind of fish for the rest. So that's the way I use the Inceptors. If you haven't run with the six-man bolter in stack, I highly recommend you try it. If you're running eradicators, now you're free to use the ignore cover strat on them and the oath on them instead of the aggressors. So that's another play for eradicators versus aggressors because normally you're restricted on, I need full value out of aggressors. They need full oath. They need ignore cover. They need to be the closest. They all the things. Bolter interceptors, they don't care. They could split fire. They're getting plus one to hit at least on one of those units if the incursor shot. They're re-rolling all the wounds, hitting on twos, very efficient, right? So Bolter Inceptors, mm, chef's kiss. Take some, use it, enjoy it. All right, the last unit, not in this particular list, but a unit I've been using quite a bit and really like, is the Lowly Fire Strike Servo Turret. Not a unit you typically see a lot of in Marine lists. Every time I put them in one of my Marine lists, um, everyone always asks is if it's jokes if it's a joke or if this unit's any good and uh, the answer is it's a joke and it's also very good so in context it's not game breaking it's not ending the world it's cost 75 points but when you think about what it does i'll tell you why i like it it's it's good enough it does what it needs to do pretty good 
So in my mind, if you're a Marine player, you've probably had the same realization. I need some anti-tank in my list. Maybe I have a Lancer. Maybe I have Iron Storm. But if I'm in Gladius, I typically don't have tons and tons of anti-tank options. I have to draw the line somewhere. Do I want more punching? Do I want more shooting? Where is it all coming from? And your anti-tank choices are, are pretty limited. You either take some sort of Gladiator tank. You take some embedded infantry units. You take Eradicators. And if you're taking foot Eradicators, are you taking three mans? Or are you going whole hog? Six mans with the bolter interceptors or with the with the biologists. And, and typically in the past, I used to run the aggressors, and I, now I'd have to like buy a couple of three man eradicator squads as my anti tank. And those guys, when they pop off, boy, your opponent hates it, and they just complain about the most brokenest unit ever. But you know, most of the time, eradicators are wet noodles, right? Because you're hitting on fours. You're hitting on threes. If they pop smoke, it can get to fours and fives. There's only four shots. They're not going to be in plus melter range when they come in from reserve, which is typically how you're deploying them. And now you're wounding on fours on a rhino, which is its ideal target, but a normal tank toughness 10 or higher, wounding on fives. So four hits, needing fives, math is not on your side, right? Like you're, you're fishing for one or two wounds uh, on average. If they have an invulnerable save or if they get covered, like they might not die. So yeah, you get full rerolls, great. But his, historically, those guys usually are not enough with a three man to do it all on their own. They can, they very rarely can kill a vehicle all on their own, um, and that's without any defensive strats. If they start popping defensive strats, it can get really, really bad. So and that's ninety five points, and you're like that unit is really good, and you're like, mm, but they also let you down. And in this list, I really want repeatability i want flexibility i can't just like put a unit of eradicators or two and say i gotta make sure this tank dies and when i shoot and they flub what is my backup plan there and there's usually there's not enough resources just be like we'll I have to put another unit over there to make sure i'm like well if it takes three units to kill one little rhino like what am i doing right so like you know that, that becomes a little too much for me to stomach and so what i found as an alternative is the fire strike servo turret so let's talk about the profile of this and why i like it so 75 points versus 95 so if you're just thinking about trading one for one this is a little bit cheaper and it still serves that same role coming in from reserve i shoot at my little tank vehicle target and then maybe i kill it maybe i don't but you know here's my options so what is the profile on this thing it's a vehicle it's two up save six wounds toughness six so in terms of toughness six versus uh eradicators both top to six they have nine wounds this has six this has two up save they have three up saves their infantry um they move five this is a vehicle it only moves three but again i'm not really caring about its movement on the turn it comes in it's getting the position six inches off the edge and it's getting a shoot eradicators 18 inch so if a savvy opponent could potentially screen that tank so they can make it just outside of 18 so the eradicators can't even shoot at the tank they don't get full rerolls against infantry so now they're not they're not they're not wasted you're not going to spend oath for three eradicators typically so their their value drops dramatically if they don't have a target to shoot at or if their opponent is savvy and screens them out this thing shoots 36 inches what does it shoot it shoots two shots that are strength 10 ap3 d6 plus one damage so they're like baby last cannons. They're called last talons. They are twin links. So two shots that are twin link, re-rolling wounds. So very consistent. And since it's manned by a red guy, the tech marine guy, it hits on twos. So now you have this kind of thing. I don't really need oath. It's hitting on twos. It's strength 10. So I can shoot at a normal vehicle, wounded on fours. If it's a rhino, wounded on threes, twin linked. AP3, D6 plus one damage. I'm not really rolling damage like eradicators, but like the potential for one little turret to do damage on a vehicle, pretty high. To kill it outright, probably not, but also potentially scare it. If you shoot it with other things, you can soften it up. This might finish it off. And now it's a two-up save. It's not that easy to kill, and you potentially have this thing threatening your opponent that can shoot long range. Now they have to decide, do they want to waste time shooting at the turret? And you can make all sorts of jokes about, like, the turret got you because it's terrible, and then that just makes your opponent focus even more on the turret. So I've played many games where I'm just like trying to hope that the turret does fantastic things. And when it does, I just revel in it and it makes the game so much more fun and exciting. 
I think when you have an, a favorite unit, you can just do that. And then whether that unit is actually good or not, if it just does things, you're automatically going to be more excited. Your opponent's going to feed on that energy and potentially hopefully have a fun game all the way around. So one last thing about the turret, you can buy them in units of two. Um, their special rule is they overwatch on fours. So if you shoot at a unit, potentially you spent for the oath, you shoot at it, you don't kill it. If it now moves, you can overwatch two shots hitting on fours. Maybe if you have two of the turrets, you have four shots hitting on fours. With the oath, you're full rerolling, twin link, free rerolling. You could potentially kill. I've killed carnivores in overwatch multiple times. Um, it is a glorious thing when the turret uh, stops a carnivore from charging in because you shot it on overwatch. What's it going to do? Stand back there and not charge you? Like it's moving towards you. You know you can set it up. Another thing I like to do with the turrets is um, set them up, shoot. And since they move so slow, everyone's like, well, they never do anything. They only move three. Well, you like, what if I YOLO that nine inch onto the objective? I'm OC2. You potentially, two of them, you can be OC4. You can like take objectives with turrets, which is hilarious. Uh, sometimes two up save vehicles on an objective. Now they swamp you with some chumps and you're like, I don't care. I'm a vehicle. I shoot out of combat. I hit on twos. No big deal. So interesting. Um, neat. 150 points for two. Kind of tough. But in the new world of bring it down, they don't give up enough p wounds to like push you to threshold. So two turrets is still only two points of bring it down. So like they don't give up a lot of kill points for bring it down. So it's an interesting choice. Um, in this particular list, I did not have enough points for them. The scouts cost 65. This cost 75. I only had 65 left. So I, I would love to have a turret in that list instead of that third unit scouts. But the third unit scouts in my list actually has proven to be quite useful. So the last thing I like to use with these guys is typically when you come in from reserve, you're really just trying to kill and get angles, shoot something. But sometimes you're like, I need to screen somebody because I don't want them to get angles on my backfield or maybe get a shot on my big tank or my aggressor or my inceptors or whatever. And I just need to screen. And so this is a unit that I literally do not care if it dies. I hope that they target it. Worst case scenario, like I might just pop armor contempt and it might just live, right? Like I've got it shot by ridiculous things and it just like cover with a two up save, toughness six. Sometimes like that's just too much to shift. But if this thing is out here blocking deep strikes, blocking reserves, and now they come over here and kill it, that's fantastic, right? Like that's more for me to do, uh, less for me to worry about. You can have this thing, but now I can now attack all the things that came in and got it, right? If you want to pull out a tank to kill it, even better, now my tanks can come and shoot you. I have a Lancer in the background, potentially come and shoot you, or I have Inceptors or Eradicators drop down now to shoot at your exposed thing that shot at my turret. Lots of cool things that the turrets do. So if you have points, if you haven't tried it, turrets, not too bad. And if you uh, you play a couple of them, I, I was running them as doubles. I was running as two units of one. I had two turrets. Uh, I really liked it. I liked having them there. I, I, I was running them on objectives, doing crazy stuff with turrets. No one wanted to shoot at turrets to save and cover. They're just like, ah, nothing. So turrets, surprisingly good. So if you're interested as an option for Marines, I highly recommend it. Especially in Gladius, you can always go into Devastator Doctrine and advance and shoot it. So like, it could be like, oh, it only moves three. Can't go through walls. Ha, ha, ha. And then you're like, well, I advance and shoot. And they're like, what is happening? Or I advance and charge, right? You're like, I don't need to shoot because there's nothing in range that I can see. But now I advance and charge and get on this objective. I've also had it where... I've got a Demon Prince down to one wound. I shot the kitchen sink at it. It was a Thousand Sun Demon Prince. He did the blank saves. He did the reroll saves. That Demon Prince lived when he shouldn't had no business living. And I'm like, I have to kill this Demon Prince because they're about to do Thousand Sun things to me. And I'm like, how can I stop it? How can I stop it? And I look down and I'm like, well, I got a turret. I'll have to charge it. Maybe I'll clip the last wound. And then I realize, hey, wait a minute. It's a vehicle. Tank shock, baby. So sure enough, I tank shock to kill the demon prince. So there are ways, if you're desperate enough, Calgar gives you extra CP, so you always have a chance when Calgar's alive, giving you extra CP to do all the crazy things. Have some fun with it. Play around. Those are the kind of things that I love to do in the game, and it always gets those surprising looks from your opponent because those aren't things you typically see, and then you can catch them out in the game. It's not a gotcha moment. It's just one of those, wow, I never see marines played that way and, and marines have so many different units that people don't use or, or combinations that aren't like readily uh out in the wild that you can certainly amp up the damage amp up the firepower 
and if you position it and you practice. So hope this video was helpful. Lots of trips. If you have any uh, uh, thoughts about what I've said or if you have any combos of your own that you want to share, drop them in the comments. Let me know. Hit me up. Happy to talk more about Space Marines. If you like this type of video, let me know. Be happy to put out more as we start doing more uh, videos and armies for the new edition. 10.5, we like to call it, with the new rules. Pariah Nexus. Certainly going to be some changes there to the missions and the secondaries. We'll have to have talks about why and what we do as we tweak and build more ultramarine lists. Uh, but that's it for now. Thanks, guys, for watching, and we'll see you next time.